Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to All right, we're almost there. In just mere hours, we'll be able to gleefully shout, Christ is born, and glorify him. Now, every year around this time, articles start going up all over the Internet attacking the various customs and celebrations of Christmas, seeking to diminish the sacredness of the celebration, to reduce it to mere commercialism, to remove Christ from Christmas. Now, how many have heard or read that this whole thing, this whole thing right around December 25th, is just the assimilation of a pagan holiday anyway, and the church just kind of threw it in there? Show of hands, how many heard that Christmas is just a Christian relabeled winter solstice party? Yeah, got several here. All right, how many have heard that Christ couldn't possibly be born in December because it's too cold for shepherds? Yeah. How many have heard that the tree is some kind of weird druid earth worship totem or something like that? All right. How many have heard it's all pagan in origin, and therefore we must remove Christ from it and purify it back to its sacred pagan roots so the rest of us can feel good about ourselves? What if I told you they're all wrong? What if I told you that Christmas and the customs and traditions that surround it are thoroughly Christian in origin? Let's start with the date. The Internet would tell you that December 25th was just arbitrarily picked, that it was the Christianization of the Roman imperial holiday of Sol Invictus, birthday of the unconquered sun. Christians just latched on to this pre-existing pagan holiday and stole it. We stole it from the pagans. But is it really that? Let's grab the Bible in Luke chapter 1. We hear the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah. Now, who was Zechariah? Priest of the temple, father of John the Baptist. So what does the father of the forerunner have anything to do with the dating of Christmas? Plenty. Let's look no further than the Holy Bible. All right. From Luke. Now while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, it fell to him by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. All right, so let's chew on that for a minute. What holiday in Judaism are they burning incense continuum? Yom Kippur. Day of Atonement. So when you start figuring out when Yom Kippur falls, or rather fell 2,000 years ago, you'll find that you're somewhere right in the middle or towards the end of September, right around September 23rd. It's no coincidence then that the church celebrates the feast of the conception of John the Forerunner on September 23rd. And then if we add nine months to that, 270 days, we're now at June 24th. June 24th, where again the church celebrates another feast, the nativity of John the Forerunner. So we also know from Scripture that Elizabeth, Zachariah's wife, she was pregnant with John six months before Mary was pregnant with Jesus. So if we go back to the date of the conception of the Forerunner, what's six months from that? March 25th. What do we celebrate on March 25th? It's on these holy... Well, the holy doors are... Well, I have to shut them to see. What is it? No, 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 no. The Annunciation. The Annunciation. Angel Gabriel appearing. All right. So add months to, and so yeah. So all right, March 25th, Annunciation. Add nine months to that, then where are we? December 25th. Now in the apostolic period, you can find no less than three different, three independent sources that define the date to antiquity of the, of the nativity as December 25th. St. Irenaeus, for example, tradition holds as he's the one who figured it out the date of the Annunciation and then by extension derive the date of the nativity to that. Another writer, Hippolytus, 
or Elitis, I guess, Hippolytus, um, in 202 AD, also arrives at December 25th from his own research. Lastly, a historian, Sextus Julius Africanus, in 221 AD, also arrives through his own research December 25th. Okay, well, what about this pagan holiday? Yes, there is a, it was a pagan holiday called Saul Invictus. But it was not decreed a holiday in the Roman Empire until 274 by Emperor Aurelian. So whose feast is older? Who stole from who? Notice all the arguments. All the arguments you hear all over the Internet, they're always arguing about December 25th, December 25th. You never hear anything about March 25th, never hear anything about September 23rd, never hear anything about June 24th. They're just throwing the rocks at, at, at December. But you've got to take the whole thing. The whole thing fits together in one perfect, holy little package. Point is, December 25th, the Nativity of Jesus Christ, is purely Christian. And not pagan. All right, Deacon John, okay, I hear you. But what about these shepherds in the field? Look outside. Look about last week. It was freezing out here last week. Surely shepherds don't tend their flocks in the snow, in the snow-covered fields. Well, okay, yeah, that might be so. But had the incarnation occurred here in North America, you know, we're not looking at the weather out in Bethlehem, Georgia. What does Google weather say the weather is like in Tel Aviv? All right, I wrote this homily on Wednesday. On Wednesday of last week, highs were in the low 70s and the overnights were in the low 60s in Tel Aviv. Suffice to say, that argument falls flat and shepherds would certainly still be out in the fields. You know, low 70s, overnights in the 60s, that's great camping weather. All right, okay, Deacon John, all right, we'll accept the date and we'll accept the this and the shepherds. But what about these trees? These things are certainly pagan totem poles. We've got to get rid of them. You know, okay, well, why are these trees internet? Uh, or why are these trees pagan? Because the internet said so. Okay, well, what if I told you that the Christmas tree was also ancient, Christian, and first practiced in the Christian East? Now, today we heard in the gospel the genealogy of Christ, name upon name, some good, some bad, mostly men, some women, some not even Israelite. But going forward to show that Jesus Christ is born of woman, is God made flesh, true man and true God, like us in all things apart from sin. Now, in Isaiah 11, which I think is, will be read tonight as part of the, sele the reading selections of the Vesperal Liturgy. Uh, it, Isaiah 11, prophecy says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. Now, a Father Jeff Harvey, a priest out of Australia, he wrote an article on the origin of the tree, and for this next section, I'm going to steal from him. <laughs> I'm going to borrow. I will borrow. I cited him, so therefore it's okay. Uh, he writes, he shares with us this. He says this, St. Cosmas, the poet, refers to this verse when he wrote of Christ as the blossom, which rose up out of the virgin stem from the stump of Jesse. The root is Jesse, David's father. The rod, King David. The flower, which came from the root, and the, came from the root and the rod, is the Theotokos. And the fruit which came forth from the flower of the Panagia Theotokos is Jesus Christ. Thus, the tree then, it's a reminder of the genealogy. It's a reminder of the genealogy of Christ as man. It's the love of God, but also the successive purification of the forefathers of Christ. And at the top is the star. Well, angels here, but anyway, the star of which is the God man, uh, God man Christ. So the tree, the tree is evergreen never losing its vitality in the winter, and is therefore symbolic of the tree of life and the fact that Christ himself is the tree of life. Okay, Deacon John, that's a pretty picture that poet paints, but, but I thought you said it was ancient, Eastern. Okay, well, in 512 A.D., the emperor Anastasios I built a church at the monastery of St. Gabriel in northern Syria. Among the decorations, he offered... Two large brass trees which stood on both sides of the beautiful gate. That's the, the whole royal doors, holy doors. Uh, on two sides of the beautiful gate of the sanctuary. On the leaves of the trees, there was a place for lights to flicker. Each tree had 180 lamps and 50 silver chains from top to bottom. On these hung small objects of gold, silver, or copper, as well as red eggs, vases, animals, birds, crosses, wreaths, bells, carved grape bunches, discs, etc., all right, in the great church of Hagia Sophia, Constantinople, 
Paul the Silent, uh, Silentary, uh, in our, one of his ancient writings that dates back from the five, well, his writing, his writing was, it's an ancient, you know what I'm trying to say. He's ancient writing at that time. Um, at 506, uh, at 560 AD. 560 AD, he writes that before the iconos, so in Hagia Sophia, this guy's writing said that before the iconostasis, there were metal cone-shaped trees like a pine tree or a cypress of tender foliage where instead of fruits, they had conically shaped lights. And so his writing goes on to show that these ornamental tree-like sculptures were all over the church, Christmas trees in Hagia Sophia. So therefore, it is not just the cut down pagan yule log, but rather the upright tree of paradise. There are so many other things I could get into that Father Jeff so wonderfully shares. He has, talks about the elaboration. He goes into much more detail on the elaboration of the star, why we even exchange gifts, even more on the whole cave, you know, the cave made stable. But the point is, no, sorry pagans, but Christmas is Christian. It doesn't matter how loud they shout it. It doesn't matter how far they repeat the great lie over and over again. It doesn't make it true. Truth is still there. Truth is always quiet. It's the lies that are loud. Truth is simple. So tonight, and all through Christmas time, share the good tidings with one another. Share the good news. Share the nativity greeting. Christ is born. Share that God is with us. Do not, do not be ashamed to say it. Do not be afraid to say it. Wish each and every one of you Merry Christmas. Glory to Jesus Christ.